the amazing freeing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, I cannot emphasize the, the freedom in Christ Jesus because of this blood. And I so pray that you will um, get hold of this today. This is the eighth week now since we've been going through this. And I want you to grab hold of the freedom so that when you leave church this morning, you are different than from when you arrived. Okay, let's go. Redemption is what we started with. I want you to just look at these scriptures as we go through very fast because I want to go towards the end. In him, in Christ Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Get, notice <coughs> the word sins is plural. When I pray just before that all your sins are forgiven, that's what I'm talking about. The word sins is in plural. Plural. Past, present, future. Plural. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of your grace. I don't think any of us have fully understood the richness of God's grace. We haven't even scratched the surface. This, the grace of God is what turns people upside down. It breaks warlocks and those are in satanic um, circles. Turn them right around. It's this grace. And a lot of us don't know what this grace is about. So when it talks about the riches, it's extremely rich. Very, very rich. Anyhow, we have to move fast. This blood of Jesus has bought you back. Now, when you bought something, you have been bought. Bought from who? Bought from Satan. You are now Jesus' position. And I pray that as we go through quickly these realities and declarations, <coughs> that you would get the glimpse of, of who you really are right now, not who you were last year or 60 years ago or 30 years ago, but who you are right now, that you would actually get a revelation of the new self. Through the blood of Jesus, we've been saying that we have been redeemed, we have been bought, we have been purchased by Jesus out of the devil's hand. The devil has zero power over you. Hear that again. The devil has zero power over you. The only power he has over you is your agreement. When you agree with him, when he knocks on the door and you accept all his condemnation, and you accept all his accusations, and you accept your past. I've been saying now for a wee while, I don't have a past but a cross. That's the only time the devil gets you, when you agree. But as far as God's concerned, that verse was written by God. That's not my verse. The Bible is God's word. Psalms says, your word forever, O Lord, is settled in heaven, meaning it's settled for all eternity. That verse will never, ever, ever, ever change. So please accept forgiveness of sins, plural. He did not miss a single sin on that cross. Not a single one. So if he has forgiven you, and you have guilt and shame, guess where that's coming from? It's not your loving Father. It's not Jesus Christ. Certainly not the voice of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between conviction of sin 
and accusation and condemnation and guilt. Big, big difference. Let's say that together. Through the blood of Jesus, I have been redeemed, bought, purchased by Jesus out of the hand of the devil. And that is the reality. I hope, I hope you're getting this. You have been bought. You have been purchased by that precious, precious blood. You are no longer in that camp. That's the amazing freeing power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, cleanses. First John 1 John 1.7 But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And I said to you, I don't know how many times now, that the word cleanses is in present tense, meaning that it happens all the time. You sin, cleanse, you sin, cleanse, you sin. But the church, I should I call it religion, has taught us that when you sin next time, you better go and get Jesus hop back on the cross to wipe this one out. That's what we've been taught. But that's not in the Bible. You will see very soon. The Bible says once and for all. Once. Once. Once means once. But we've been so, so taught and become sin conscious that we are trying so hard to escape sin. And do you know what happens when you try to escape sin? You sin more. You sin more. Anyhow, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's a little bit later on. Initially, I used to love praying for people and miracles and signs and wonders. And I realized it's ineffective for one person to pray for 100 people. But if I equip 100 people, then we get into the thousands, aren't we? So I really want you to grab hold of these revelations. As I said, I am free. I feel so, so free. I'm so excited about this freedom. But are you? Or are there things that you're hanging on you? That when you think about it, you say, oh no, that's right. See, that oh no, you're not free. You are not free. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit's revelation, you will see yourself different. Let's see, uh, let's um, declare this. While I walk in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses me now and continually from all sin. <coughs> you better believe that. That's what, the, that's what the verse is. And by the way, some people get hung up in that first part. But if we walk in the light, and so they say to themselves, well, I'm not walking in the light, I'm, I'm sinning, I'm, I'm being a bad person, and so forth. So they try to walk in the light. <coughs> Do you know what walking in the light is? Being friends with God. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what walking in the light means. Jesus is the light of the world. Walk with Jesus, you walk in the light. So tr stop trying and fix it yourself, because that's, that's what the problem is. While I walk in the light, I have fellowship with other Christians. I get on well with other Christians. That's what it says, fellowship with one another. And his blood cleanses me continually from all sin. Number three, this amazing, amazing power of Jesus. The freedom, justification to make righteous, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I mean, you can't get any, any bolder claim than this. Being justified means made righteous. So that killed and shame that's knocking on your heart and your mind, that's not righteousness. That's condemnation. And yet the verse says, having now been made righteous, having now been justified, Justified, passive tense, something's been done to you. I hope you read my email on substitution. Something has been done to you. You have been substituted on the cross of Jesus Christ. He took your place. He took your place. I hope you're getting the picture. 
having now been made righteous. That's what justify means. Having now been made righteous. No, you didn't make yourself righteous. Jesus made you righteous through his death. That's what he did. Having now been made righteous, made righteous, we shall be saved from wrath through him. God and sin do not see eye to eye. He punishes sin. He hates sin. And I say to you that when you stand before God and you are covered with the blood of Jesus, saved from wrath means the wrath will not come upon you. It's gone on Jesus. So when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. And this is what we really have to get. If you are born again, believer in Christ, Jesus has taken over. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I live in this flesh, Paul says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. It starts up by saying, I am crucified. You are dead. You are dead to sin. Let's say that again. While I walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me now from all sin. Let's say it again. Through the blood of Jesus, I'm justified, acquitted, not guilty, reckoned righteous, made righteous, just if I'd never sinned. <laughs> Man, the freedom, the freedom of these words when they hit me. I felt so free and I'm still feeling so free. No past. No past whatsoever. No past. Just if I had never sinned. But religion will scream at you, you are guilty. You've just sinned last night. Wouldn't it? That's what religion does to you. Because we're being schooled with it right from the word go. <clears throat> but that's what the verse says. It says, having now, right now, being justified, made righteous by the blood of Jesus. So, my friends, please absorb this into your heart as we go along. <clears throat> now, not only being made right, just as if you had never sinned, but now you have been made holy. Made holy. I bet the majority of us here do not classify ourselves as holy. You shrink away from the, the concept of holy because you see yourself so filthy as a sinner. My friends, please don't. See yourself as God sees you. He has done all of this, death on the cross, to wipe the slate. You are no longer a sinner. Man, I wish I can preach for another eight weeks on this theme. Because there is so, so much to unpack of what Jesus has actually paid for. <clears throat> much more than, I mean, therefore Jesus also um, that he might sanctify people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Holy means separated from sin. This is one of the reasons why when you try to stop sinning, it doesn't work because you are doing Jesus' job. Jesus' job was to separate you from sin so that sin doesn't have power over you. But when you don't get this, this revelation that you have been separated and you're trying to run away, run away, run away, then you are saying, Jesus, now I can do a better job. I will do this and this and this to avoid this sin. And every time you try, sin gets you. Because sin is more powerful than you. It's in the spirit realm. That's where it's coming from. Brothers and sisters, Separated from sin, separated to God, made holy with God's own holiness. I mean, gosh, if you can get your heart into this, 
God's own holiness has made Gilevafalatu holy? I said, yes, bring it on. I like that. You made me holy. Thank you, I am holy. And so I walk around, I am holy. Jesus made me holy. Jesus makes me holy. That's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. It's only for believers, these kind of things. Are you one of them, the believers? Or the quivers? <clears throat> what is the quiver? Anyhow, here is our declaration. Through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, separated from sin, set apart to God, made holy with God's holiness. Hallelujah. <coughs> you better believe it, my brothers and sisters. You have been separated from sin and separated to God. Allow the holiness of God to hold you tight. Stop trying and be good. Let his goodness cover you. I pray that you're getting hold of this, my friends. The life of God was in the blood of Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, that unless you have, uh, you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have eternal life, and I shall raise you up in the last day. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so is he who feeds on me will live because I live. This is what Jesus is saying. And I said to you that though I knew this for many years, the taking communion every day. And I heard of people taking communion, but it wasn't until that Sandra and I started to take communion that all of a sudden we, we went to another level altogether. Because I said, Jesus, anything you say, I want to do it. I want to follow what you say. So when the revelation of the communion hit me and I thought, he's actually saying that I eat his flesh and drink his blood, I, I better do it. So I did it. We did it. And I told you the result of that. Let's declare this. Lord Jesus, when I receive your blood in it, I receive your life, the life of God, divine, eternal, endless. Thank you, Jesus. Now it's a joy every morning saying this to Jesus. Thank you for this bread. By your stripes I am healed. I am delivered. I am set free. Thank you, Jesus. Every time that communion is taken. Intercession, we saw that the blood, I mean this blood is praying for you 24-7. It's so amazing. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Who is he who condemns? Uh, please take note of this, this verse. Who is he who condemns? And then it answers, Is it Christ who died and furthermore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? The question is rhetorical. Who is doing the condemnation? It says, is it Jesus? No. Well, he's the one who died to remove condemnation. So how can he condemn me? Can you see what I'm talking about? It's not him doing the condemnation. Thank you, Jesus. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all. <coughs> you know what a ransom is? It's a price you pay to set somebody free. When a hostage is held in a gunpoint, and those people demand that amount of money. That amount of money is called a ransom. That's what he did. He paid a ransom. The ransom was his blood. It was his blood. That's what he, he paid you to free you. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this freedom of knowing that you are praying for us day and night. <coughs> Let's say this. Thank you, Jesus, that even when I cannot pray, your blood is pleading, interceding for me in heaven. Man, that's what is happening. He's praying for me. He's praying for you. That's why I keep saying, please try and stop being good. He's praying for you. And all those prayers that you're trying to do, just rely on him. Just thank him. That's why Thanksgiving is so powerful. Just thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are doing this for me, Lord. It says, when I cannot pray for whatever reason, you might have forgotten. Or you might be in the middle of something difficult. You forgot to pray. Well, he's praying. He's interceding. He's saying, Father, my brother or my sister is facing this. And my blood, and he will point to his blood. My blood, my blood paid for that. That very issue that he is facing, she is going through. My blood has paid for that too. Interceding, standing in the gap. Mediator means go between two people. He's the mediator. He's standing right there, interceding. His blood is doing that for you, my brother and sister. I hope you're getting excited as, you, as we go through, because this is the reality of what's happening in the heavenly places. Access, therefore, brethren, having boldness. Boldness. Not chicken. Boldness. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no one is chasing them. But the righteous is as bold as a lion. Bold. Bold. Why boldness? Because of the payment. Because you're free. You're so free. By a new and living way, his body was the veil, broke from top to bottom, separated. God was so holy that... Um, Sin has to be blocked out. But now, he's given his license to you and I as it, I'm your high priest. I've sacrificed my own life for you. Now you can come in. Talk with me. Anytime, anywhere. Let us draw near with a true heart full of assurance, having our hearts sprinkled from, <coughs> excuse me, from an evil conscious and our bodies washed with pure water. I will use this later on. Do you know that word conscience there? Evil, conscious. If you remove the word evil and you put the word sin, conscious, that's the problem. That's the school of religion. That's what we're being taught right from the word go. Have you heard the phrase, sinners saved by grace? That was once true before you met Jesus. But after you meet Jesus, you are no longer a sinner saved by grace. I'll say this again. Before you met Jesus, you were a sinner saved by grace. But after you have met Jesus, you are no longer a sinner saved by grace. Why do you need to be saved again by grace when you've already been saved by the Savior who came to save you? But because of this notion that though I am born again, though grace has covered me, I am still a sinner. Friends, that's what has bound millions and millions of Christians, born again Christians, speaking in tongues. That's what has bound them. They are still locked in the old covenant. You know how the old covenant, the priest has to go behind the curtain? Once a year, to forgive, like to cleanse all the sins, his sins and the sins of the people. A lot of Christians are still doing that. When they sin and when they make mistakes, they think that they have to be cleansed again. That there has to be more grace coming towards them. Friends, it says it has been sprinkled with the blood from evil 
conscience. Evil conscience. Three or two more slides, slides, and you will see my elaboration on this evil conscience. <clears throat> there is a way that you can overcome evil conscience. And I pray that this morning in Jesus' name you grab hold of this because the moment and the day you are no longer evil conscious, but you are righteousness conscious, man, your intimacy with Jesus goes to another level. And instead of trying to run away from sin, you are so righteousness conscious. You are so thinking like what Jesus is thinking. That sin, the sin is still there roaming around and trying to tempt you. But you've got different eyes, you've got different senses, you've got different everything from God's perspective. I'm a little bit ahead of myself, so access. <clears throat> Let's speak this aloud. Thank you, Jesus. That through your sprinkled blood, I have access into your presence, almighty God, into the holy of holy. That's where you are right now. How can any sin be in the holy of holy, my friends? Impossible. 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 There is no sin where God is. And where God is, you are. Please receive that today. Where God is, is where you are. Yes, you are on the earth, but as far as relationship goes, you are where God is. Because he's living inside of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do you know that First John says that a born-again person cannot sin? Check that out. Cannot sin. Now the problem with a lot of interpretation, I've I read several interpretation, and they said it means that you, you cannot habitually sin. That's wrong. Do you know what it's talking about? It's talking about that spirit of yours that was recreated in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have gone away. Behold, all things have been made new. It's talking about that, that new creation. That new creation is in the holy of holy. And that new creation in you right now, in that holy of holy, is identical to Jesus Christ. Now, that's a religious spirit doesn't like that. Because it tries to hold you back, hold you in bondage. I can't go into the holy of holy. I'm not identical to Jesus Christ. The religious spirit will try and, and make sure that it imprisons you. You don't go there. But I look up 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. He who, is, he who is united with the Lord, united means like that, is one spirit with him. Identical. One spirit with him. Is that correct? Has somebody looked it up? 1 Corinthians 6, 7. One spirit with him. One spirit. Born again person. One spirit like that with Jesus Christ. Jesus does not sin, my friend. Jesus is sinless. Jesus does not have any sin. And you are like that with him. How is it possible for your spirit to be contaminated? You see what I mean? The day that you grab hold of what I'm talking about, is the day all those condemnations from your past and guilt and shame, they just evaporate. They're just gone. No more shame. 
no more guilt. Because you are with Jesus. The records have been set straight, wiped. The slate is clean. One with Jesus. He who is united with the Lord, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, is one spirit. The word one there in Greek means molecule for molecule, atom for atom. Identical. Identical. Isn't that amazing? You're actually identical to Jesus. But see, the problem is you look in a mirror and you check your mind and what you did yesterday and last night and you thought, but I sinned. Of course you did. Of course I did. But that part of you where you and Jesus are like that was not even affected. Did you know that that part of you with Jesus now, whoever's in crisis and new creation, this part of you is with Jesus like this in you, is who you are for all of eternity, my friends. When you die, there is no new you coming. That's it. That's it. Who you are now in Christ is who you are forevermore. You're not going to get a new you when you die. You see, that's why you can bring heaven to earth when you know you are in heaven. And that's the language of the Bible. We are seated with Christ in where? In heavenly places. How can you sit in heaven and sit here in church at the same time? Spirit. Your spirit is like that with him. You are seated with him. You see what I mean? Please grab hold of this because the moment you realize there is a part of you that cannot sin, and then you lean towards that part of you instead of your emotions, your feelings, your mind, and your body, and you lean towards the spirit, what will happen is that I said to you last week, reprogram the computer. What will happen is that as you read this book, the spirit you are leaning towards will teach you. He's a teacher. He's a counselor. He's a helper. He will teach you who you are in Christ. And a reprogramming of a computer will start. He will throw out religion and he will give you identity. That's what he does. He throws out the religion that was so, so holding you back. It is so, so, so amazing. The freedom, the freedom, my friends, is said like last week I felt like dancing <clears throat> the amazing freeing power of this blood my friends you better believe it the Bible says once and for all and this is the part I was trying to explain before in these coming um, slides this is where I want to conclude for this time until I mention it again in the future 9.12 says this is towards the end of the verse but with his own blood entered the most holy place once for all. And I've underlined the words, once for all. This is New King James, by the way. <coughs> In case you check up other versions and it's not there. Once for all. It is so, so, so important that you get the ones for all. Because the devil is tricking you every time you fail that Jesus missed that one. It is so, so, the devil is so, so evil that he tries to hold you in bondage. <clears throat> so he says, no, you have to ask forgiveness for this one and this one. But more worse than that, if it's the same sin, then he will say things like, typical you, you do this all the time, you see? He speaks to you. But the day you wake up to the fact that you and Jesus are like that, even when you make mistakes, there is a difference. Instead of having a pity party and feeling so sorry about yourself, that righteousness within you springs up and you turn immediately. Father, I should have seen that coming. That was wrong. And I believe your Bible is true. That's a sin. 
And I thank you for covering that one 2,000 years ago. And then you praise him. You magnify him. And as I said last week, when your computer is renewed with the book, with the word, a lot of the sins that you are struggling with now, they will just drop off. I'm talking from experience, my friends. They will just drop off. Because there's a new master in the house, and he does not like sin. He's the one that has the power to bind up the strong man. There are many strong men within our lives. He's the one. As you lean on him, paid in full. You hear this maybe this coming Friday in a Good Friday service. When Jesus hung on the cross and he said those three words, it is finished. It's actually an accounting term in the Greek. Tetelestai in Greek. And according to records, way, way back in ancient Greek, is what the accountant of the day would stamp on a bill when a bill is fully paid. Tetelestai, stamp. It is finished, meaning paid in full. Paid in full. Once and for all, you don't owe any more. It's paid. Here it is. Here's the receipt. Tetelestai, paid in full. You're free. You don't have any debt. You can go now. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? The power of the blood and all over here, my friends, is for all people. This is why we need to take the gospel to every unbeliever because did you know that those unbelievers <coughs> have been forgiven? Now that may shock you. They just don't know it. So the devil is lying to them every day and they just keep on doing whatever they're doing. They don't know that this blood has already been applied. But the day the unbeliever and the non-believer realize what Jesus has done is the day when the penny dropped and they became born again. They realize that all these sins that they've been trying to deal with, they were already gone. Paid in full for all of eternity. That's the exciting part for me, thinking that I'm not just forgiven now, but I'm forgiven for all of eternity. It's once and for all. He will never, ever, ever, ever do that. I am free from the power of sin. You are free from the power of sin. And the day that your mind is renewed by this, by this truth that you are freed, freed, separated from sin, you will no longer desire to go where sin used to be. You, because you are changing from inside out. There's a part of you that's being renewed. The computer has been rewritten. And my friends, that's the amazing freeing power of the blood of Jesus. May you receive that in Jesus' name. Secondly, perched in this verse means removed. Removed. It says, Who being the brightness of his glory, express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself perched, past tense, perched, the word is 2,000 years old, my friends. Perched. 2,000 years old. You were forgiven even before you were born. Perched. Our sins, he sat down <clears throat> at the right hand of the majesty on high. By himself perched. How did he do that? Blood. His blood perched you. His blood perched me, forgave me, cleansed me. So you see, you are perched. 
you are cleansed. You have been wiped clean of your sins. Do you know what that sit down is about? The job is done. The job is done. That's what the book of Hebrews is trying to say. He is sitting. He's not standing. He is sitting. He has forgiven you. He came to earth, paid for you, went back to heaven, sat down, and he's been sitting ever since. King of kings and Lord of lords. He's sitting on his throne. He's finished. The job is done. All your sins have been removed, purged. And my friends, that is the amazing, freeing power of the blood of Jesus. Please grab hold of this. <clears throat> With all those scriptures we've gone through, and now this is the new one I've given you today, that your sins have been purged, taken away, removed, removed, purged. And that's what the next one is. Take away. Next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who <clears throat> what? Takes away the sin of the world. He spent 2,000 years ago. He took your sins and my sins. Now, my friends, you can see the phone. What happened when I take it away? Can you see the phone? Can you see the phone? Now, can you see the phone? No. Take away. It was once there, and then he took it away. You see what I mean? Taken away means it's not there. So who's bringing it back? It's not him. Somebody else is trying to bring it back. Took it away. It says, the Lamb of God, because this was a prophetic word, Lamb of God, Old Testament, the Lamb, perfect Lamb has to be sacrificed, forgive the people's sins. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away. And by the way, you know me, I love those tenses. And the word takes, what is it? Present tense. That's why he's never failed you. When you fail, he's never failed you. And he will never, ever, ever, ever fail you. Takes away the sin of the world. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. No sin has ever escaped. <laughs> he's got the whole lot. He's got a whole world in his hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Father. I wish we've got another hour for me to preach, but coming towards the end. He has appeared to put away sin. He has appeared to put away sin. And he came 2,000 years ago and do this. He did this 2,000 years ago. The Lamb of God who takes away the the, um, the sin of the world and then he went on the cross and he took it away. He removed it. He removed it. Friends, that is the amazing freeing power of the Lord Jesus Christ and this is where we're going to land. <clears throat> no more sin conscious. I pray that you will get Get hold of this. No more sin conscious. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, <coughs> cleanse your conscience? Cleanse your conscience. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Cleanse you become so super clean. And I quote again that First John 1 John 1.7. The blood of his son Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. <laughs> Dead works. 
is what many, many Christians are doing right now. Those are dead works. Trying to appease God's blessing, favor, forgiveness to come to you. So lots of Christians are still trying so hard. <clears throat> trying so hard. Those are called dead works. Dead works. They're dead. And as I said to you, sinner versus saint. <clears throat> the day that I realized that I was a saint instead of a sinner, my prayer, the way I pray and the way I talk to Jesus changed. Totally changed. You see, before when I was a sinner, when I pray, I was crawling on the ground, really hoping that he doesn't see the sins that I did yesterday. I was so, so conscious of it. And do you know what happens to those prayers? It's full of unbelief. Full of unbelief. But the day I became a saint, <clears throat> I became his brother, family, belong together. I just walk in and out. Hello, Jesus. Driving a car. This is an awesome day, Jesus. Saint. You have totally different. Your, your perception of who God is and who you are is totally different. Saint instead of, of a sinner. <clears throat> That's the amazing freeing power of this blood. So in conclusion, my friends, please think like a saint. And you're all most welcome. This is our last slide. You're most welcome to any of these slides. <coughs> because that is amazing freeing power of the very, very, very blood that has forgiven you. Does that make sense? And I pray that in Jesus' name from this day forward that you will be able to see yourself as cleansed Clean, pardoned, forgiven, sanctified, justified, totally redeemed, bought from Satan, with Jesus now. Because my friends, <coughs> when that happens, you will experience what I experienced back then and still today. I have no shame whatsoever of my past. It's wiped, gone for good. No shame whatsoever. I am free. And I pray that you will be free once you grab hold of this. That you will wake up in the morning and you see Jesus smiling at you. Or in the middle of the night, Daddy will wake you up just to tell you how much he loves you. He did it last night and I said, I love you too, Father. Thank you so, so much. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that the spirit of religion is exposed this morning and that my brothers and sisters and all of us here would now say, Jesus, thank you for your blood from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for your blood. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the freedom, Jesus, that you have given us. Let your blessings and your favor fall upon every good soil this morning. To your glory and to your honor. Amen. Amen.